Hey everybody, it's Sarah Whiting here, Executive Director of St. John's Church Foundation. Welcome to another talk. And today we're gonna to focus on the Franklin Street burying ground for the Jewish community. Uh, Ryan Smith specializes in American religious history, material culture, and historic preservation. He received a PhD in American civilization from the University of Delaware and his MA in history from the College of William and Mary. Now, Ryan has a new book coming out. It's Death and Rebirth in a Southern City, Richmond's Historic Cemeteries. This book is an exploration of the history and recovery of burial grounds in Richmond. And this is an exploration through the lens of race. Uh, your book is coming out in November, is that right? That's right. If, okay, uh, so. if the world is still existing in November, <laughs> yes. So hopefully it'll be published then. Yeah, I'm well... Always I'm always happy to chat cemeteries with you, Sarah. Thanks for <laughs> inviting me back here. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to have you back. And um, I would say everybody go ahead and order your book now. I have pre-ordered on Amazon. And before I forget, I want to plug your website. Uh, Ryan has this fabulous website, richmondcemeteries.org. And boy, talk about, you could just go down the rabbit hole and explore every cemetery in Richmond. Um, it's fabulous. It's a wonderful resource. Yeah, I'd like to keep expanding and adding to it. The students are a big part of the research that shows up there. And so just as with your, your graveyard series, there's, there's a million stories to tell about all this. There, there are a million stories. And I think I forgot to say that Ryan is a professor of history at VCU, so I apologize for that. But <laughs> last time we talked, we talked about um, St. John's Church and being the first uh, burying ground for white residents in Richmond. And we talked about the African burial ground which was the burial ground for enslaved and free African Americans, 1806. I think that's when that was established. But today we're gonna to talk about the Jewish community. And I think the first place to start is the Franklin Street burying ground, which if I'm correct, is the first Jewish cemetery in Virginia. Is that that's true? right, yes, okay. it is. Richmond has a really important Jewish history in the history of American Judaism overall. Um, Richmond Congregation Beth Shalom, which gets founded in 1789, is actually just the sixth congregation, uh, Jewish congregation and synagogue that's been founded, you know, from the colonial period upwards. So it's it's really early on. And then Richmond's Jewish community uh, does quite well for itself and is integrated pretty well into the city's structures. But we think that one of the first Jewish residents in town was a guy named Isaiah Isaacs. Who was a merchant who came here by way of, of London and uh, our best guess is that he was in the city by 1769 so before mm -hmm. the American Revolution and uh, as I said he was a merchant and he seemed to be operating he bought some lots down near Main Street at the base of Church Hill and he was soon joined by others um, including his partner Jacob Cohen and others in the Mordecai families and uh, as I said that early kind of settlement uh, of Jews in Richmond um, had a lot of crossover with the Gentile population. They served in the um, city council once the city council was established. They were on various kind of boards related to trade. Uh, they were in the militia. They served um, in uh, the Freemasons Lodge. And uh, Jacob Cohen, who I just mentioned, was actually a veteran of the Revolutionary War. Apparently, we think that he had been captured by the British while fighting with the, the revolutionaries, with the Patriots, uh, and then was held in a prison ship off of Charleston. And once they let him go, he, he headed north and, wow. and ended up in Richmond. So there's a uh, Revolutionary War connection with the Street, Franklin Street Burying Ground, uh, as well as up on the hill at St. John's. Wow. Now, I know it's St. John's, but okay, it was restricted by race, but you, it, there was no restriction by religion. Uh, is, Correct. Um, so there's a, there's a really important hinge point, which is the revolution itself. Before that time, it was expected that everybody was a member of the established church. So church and state were the same. There was the Anglican Church or the Church in England, and everybody who lived here was supposed to pay taxes into that, and technically were supposed to show up for worship and that kind of thing, and then would have been expected to bury in the grounds. But the Jewish residents had an exception to that. They surely would have had to pay you know, taxes for the support of the established church, but they probably would not have been forced to attend worship, and they would have been allowed a certain kind of latitude in their own opinions on things. But all of that really becomes 
changed after the American Revolution, especially in Virginia with the passage of the Statute for Religious Freedom mm -hmm. that Thomas Jefferson had authored in the 1770s and uh, turned into a law here in Virginia in 1786. And this is before the Bill of Rights and it applies at the state level, but it's really, really important because it means that anybody who lives in Virginia can then have any religious belief that they want. They don't, they're not forced to have a particular religious belief. And then they can, um, all of their civil rights are separate from those beliefs. So nothing is gonna prevent them from being governor or from holding property, uh, according to which church or synagogue that they belong to or don't, don't belong to. And so it's after that, that um, as you know, at St. John's Churchyard, the city starts to invest and expands the churchyard by those two front city lots. And it opens it up to people of all white people of all denominations. It specifies there in its ordinance that anybody of any white person of any denomination can be buried there. And so therefore the Episcopal church that kind of comes out of the disestablishment of the Anglican church continues, but it's pretty small, right? So the Baptists and the Methodists really start to grow during that time among the Christians. And so we would expect that there's some Baptists and some Methodists and maybe some Quakers uh, and maybe some atheists who were buried in the churchyard. I don't know of any specifically of Jewish residents that were buried in the churchyard, although after the Statute for Religious Freedom and Disestablishment and with the expansion in 1799 in the churchyard, they would have been allowed to do so. Um, but there was a long tradition among Jewish populations to, uh, to bury in what they would call a Beth Haim or a house of life was their euphemism for the cemetery, for the burial ground. And so when this little uh, congregation gets formed, Beth Shalom in 1789, one of the first things they do is not build a synagogue, but it's actually to set aside a burying ground for themselves. They were renting rooms for their synagogue meetings and they don't get their own dedicated synagogue until the 1820s. But well before then they knew that they wanted to have their own kind of claim on the land to be buried among their, their co-religionists and uh, be able to operate that land in the way that, that they wanted to with their own kind of rituals and their own traditions and practices and prayers. And so that's where this kind of patriarch of the community, Isaiah Isaacs, he gives a, a city lot over to some trustees that were all affiliated with Beth Shalom and he sets it aside. It's just a very narrow city lot. We're gonna talk about it, I'm sure, in just a minute, kind of 40 feet wide. It's on what we call today Franklin Street, at the time, it was called Middle Street, I believe, and it's in between 20th and 21st. And it was right around the corner from his, his own business. He operated a tavern, the Burden Hand Tavern on Main Street, mm -hmm. and he had some other lots in the area. So he took kind of a private portion of his own land, and he gave it to these trustees, and he said it would be for the burial of all the Jews in Richmond that wanted to be buried there. And he also specified that of any Jews outside of Richmond. And you mentioned at the start here that this is what we think is the first kind of official Jewish burial ground in the state. There are others that would pop up in Alexandria and in Norfolk, but those were decades later. So this 1791 date when Isaacs opens up this portion of his yard for Jewish burials is, is really a landmark in the state's history. And, and you can go by, you still see the, the fence uh, around today. It, and when you, you're, when you go by, you're sort of struck besides the fact that there's, it's covered or it's surrounded by an apartment building, a modern apartment building now, but it's a pretty small lot. Um, what, and we, when we talk about Richmond uh, back in the 1790s, we know that it was uh, half uh, African-American free and enslaved and half white. Do we know what the Jewish population was at that time? Uh, well, there's one calculation that the 29 heads of families that founded Beth Shalom represented about one-sixth of the white population of the city. So it's a pretty substantial, you know, segment uh, of Richmond, and especially when you think about that a lot of those Jewish residents were landholders, uh, were prosperous merchants, owned slaves, participated in the slave trade themselves, so, and were on positions of authority with city council and with the militia. And so they, they exerted a very important kind of influence in the city itself. So uh, I'm trying to get, you know, because I'm always of the mindset, how many people are buried wherever? I'm thinking in, in, this, in this small lot, do we have any idea? That's the most fascinating question. And the, um, there's a long kind of history of the lot that I'd like to touch on just really quickly. You mentioned what it looks like today. There's the apartment complex around it. 
And then there's also that gate above it that, that has the sign that features it as the first uh, Jewish cemetery in Virginia. Um, but before all of that, we're not really sure how many people were buried there. Again, it was an operation, we think, from about um, 1791 up until 1816. So it ran for almost 20 years or so. It's a narrow city lot. How many folks would have been buried there? Certainly dozens, um, multiple dozens. Uh, I don't know that I've heard a really kind of reliable count. Um, and part of that is because in 1816, when they closed that lot, it's because the Jewish community uh, petitioned the city for a new burial ground on the north side of town near the poorhouse where the city had bought land to replace, as we know, St. John's Churchyard, right? St. John's Churchyard was filling up. And so they knew that there was going to be a new burial ground for whites there. In 1816, also, the city opened up um, two acres, uh, one acre for free people of color, another for what they called Negroes or enslaved African Americans, enslaved residents. And um, so the, the city's Jews knew that they needed more land and they wanted to be in this new kind of uh, cemetery neighborhood, so to speak. And so the city gave them an acre, which uh, would eventually grow to what it is today. We call that Hebrew Cemetery. And so when that opened, um, we're not quite sure what happened to those older graves that were on Franklin Street. Mm. And that is the magic question. Um, there are only two grave markers that survive there. Um, there is one for Israel Cohen, who was the brother, the younger brother of Jacob Cohen, who was the business partner of Isaiah Isaacs. And there's also uh, the grave marker of Hester Cohen, who was the uh, wife of Jacob Cohen. And so those two are in the back of the lot. If you go to the site today, you can peer into the what looks like a courtyard now, it, it, pressed in between that uh, apartment building. And they are um, in the back corner, they've got a cap on them, so you can't literally see the stones. But we would recognize what they look like from St. John's Churchyard. They are these flat, horizontally laid ledger stones, these really mm -hmm. large, they almost look like doors, you know, laying down flat on the ground. And they've got the little brick bases underneath them, lifting those stones up. And so, in, they look by a distance very much like those ledger stones on brick foundations that you see in St. John's Churchyard. There's a big difference in that there's inscriptions on those two stones that survive. Um, the top part is in the Hebrew script and the bottom part is in English. And so there's a really neat kind of gesture towards these different kinds of audiences or at least a grave, a stone carver that was able to somehow translate, you know, the the Hebrew script that those patrons had asked for and the English script below. And the script doesn't quite match up. The Hebrew script tends to be a little bit more ceremonial, a little bit more religious, a little bit more pious, um, uses words like exalted, you know, righteous. On Israel Cohen's marker, it includes a very um, common uh, inscription for uh, Jewish burials at this time. It says, may the righteous be remembered for a blessing May his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. Wow. And that's a quotation from the, uh, the first book of Samuel, which appears on a lot of Jewish gravestones at the time. What, what's, um, the, what's the date of there? The, the date on that one is 1803. Mm -hmm. And the date on Hester Cohen's was the very next year, 1804. But I should also say that the Hebrew and the English script also state the, uh, the Jewish calendar as well for those burials, which would have been uh, 5563 for Israel Cohen, and of course 5564 for, um, for Hester Cohen. So they're using both the Hebrew calendar and the English calendar on those inscriptions. Do we have a maker's mark on there by any chance to know who the crowd not, not that I've seen. I haven't, here's where I confess that I have not put <laughs> eyeballs on the stones themselves. They're underneath a cap. And so what I have seen are the transcriptions and some photographs that are now stored at the Beth Ahaba Museum and Archives, which is on uh, Franklin Street at the other end of town. And Beth Ahaba's Museum and Archives is a wonderful facility. They've got a great staff. They've got tremendous holdings there. And they were kind of the inheritors of this Franklin Street site. And so they've got the best information on the city on, on this site. Well, how come they were not removed, if I'm getting this right, those right. who were at the Franklin Street burial ground were 
uh, removed and moved to a Hebrew cemetery? Is the that early history of Jews in Richmond, written by the community, the leaders of the community themselves, say that burials were removed to the new site of Hebrew cemetery. But imagine that job. That's a, that's a lot of graves. <laughs> That's a lot of grave markers. Yeah. There's, another, there's another comment made by uh, a, a resident, a Jewish resident, um, Jacob Ezekiel, who said that some of the markers were buried underneath, just kind of tipped over and laid underneath the grass. And so I don't know that anybody's gone around there with you know, a, a probe and tried to make sure what's, what's underneath that grass or not. There's one gravestone that I know of in the newer Hebrew cemetery that dates from 1815, or at ah. least that's the date of death, before it opened in 1816. So that might be one that was moved over, but there's not a whole section that, that we know of in Hebrew of those that were relocated. And so it's really just a mystery of what happened to those graves. And it becomes an important question because the Jewish community basically shifts its attention to that new site of Hebrew and the old site becomes a site of squatters, really. There's a coal dealer, a lumber dealer. There's apparently some tracks that, that go through the site. And so after the Civil War, um, when people are starting to think in the city about dead people and bodies and cemeteries and memory and how people are going to be remembered, there's a really neat article in the Richmond Daily Dispatch from about 1866, which recalls the story of what they say is the old Israelitish burying ground. And they say, isn't it unusual that this ground has been allowed to kind of fall away and it's now overrun with weeds and it's got these cart paths and kind of horse trails kind of through the site itself. So it's in the business district of the city, as we know, and it seems like it just kind of was reintegrated into the business life of the city. Um, but with all of this kind of renewed attention, and uh, St. John's Churchyard at this time goes through a little bit of a, a, a dry spell for itself uh, before it gets kind of taken, retaken care of towards the end of the 19th and early 20th century. And so I think the Jewish community starts to refocus on that site in the late 1890s when uh, that resident who I mentioned, Jacob Ezekiel, had moved away by that time, but there's some great letters in the Beth Ahaba archives where he's trying to rally the Jewish population here to reclaim that site. As, as its historic importance as the first Jewish burial ground. And there may be burials, again, still there. There certainly are those two surviving markers that maybe were just too heavy to move. I don't know, you know why they, they might still be there or why not. And so he hires a lawyer and they clear off the squatters and Beth Ahaba, who by this time had kind of reabsorbed that initial congregation of Beth Shalom, Beth Ahaba set up the ceremony for the rededication in 1909. And so when you walk by today and you see that plaque, that sign over the top that says First Jewish Cemetery in Virginia, 1791, that was raised apparently by Beth Ahaba in 1909 or right around there for that rededication ceremony. And there's a fantastic photograph that shows uh, Rabbi um, Kalish, who was the leader of the congregation at the time, and other dignitaries in their formal wear lined up in front of that sign that you can see wow. today. And there's Others kind of seated for the ceremony throughout the yard. And you can see that it's, it's not surrounded by those buildings that we see there today. It's, it's pretty open. And so they put up a wall around it and they gave lots of speeches. If we think about what was happening in 1909, there were a lot of newer waves of Jewish immigrants coming into this country at the time. Mm -hmm. After the Civil War, especially after the 1880s, 1890s, this is Ellis Island era, right? This is the Statue of Liberty era. This is give me your tired, your poor, um, uh, your huddled masses. And so this is when immigration overall spikes in America and especially um, unusual for American populations, Eastern European Jews come in in very large numbers from Russia, from Poland, from Ukraine. And so some of those folks end up in Richmond and they don't merge as well as they might with the older German Jews, largely, of Beth Ahaba. And so they create their own kind of synagogues, also here on the east end of town. Sir Moses Montefiore was one of those early kind of Eastern European synagogues that gets founded. And so these older, I might say better assimilated, wealthier Jews in town were, were worried by some backlash 
that these newer arrivals who spoke Yiddish, who, who looked a little bit different, were a little bit more orthodox minded rather than the reform minded of Beth Ahaba. And so what we see there is Rabbi Kalish kind of reclaiming the position of Jews in the city. And he has some really pointed things to say about, you know, we're not foreigners, we're not, um, you know, suspicious. We're no, we should no longer be called aliens and foreigners in the land. And so they're pointing back to their deep roots in Virginia and uh, their, their, their role in the life of the city from, you know, the colonial period onward. So it's a really interesting time there, that 1909 dedication ceremony as a way to kind of manage some of those anxieties and difficulties that were coming in with the new immigration. So we have these, um, if we're talking about um, burial grounds, so we've got the, the um, Franklin Street burial ground, and by 1816 we have Hebrew uh, mm -hmm. Cemetery. Uh, and then, so then these other um, smaller Jewish burial grounds pop up as well. Do you have a second to talk about some of those other ones? Or? The Sir Moses Montefiore congregation gets going about 1886. And again, just like the earlier congregations before them, one of the first things they do is set about acquiring land for their own burials. And out uh, off of what we call, now call Jenny Share Road, which is near East Richmond Road, is uh, Sir Moses Montefiore Cemetery from 1888 up until today, still active, uh, still a very important site. It also has kind of a gate and a sign over the top, noting its kind of its historic role from that period onward. And then next to it, um, from the early uh, 1900s, is oddly for Richmond, I think, a socialist cemetery, yeah. the Workmen's Circle Cemetery, um, which were basically secular uh, immigrants, you know, from Eastern Europe. Some of them, most of them maybe had been um, of Jewish kind of ancestry. And so they're quite comfortable next to the Sir Moses Montefiore Cemetery. And then also on the other side of Sir Moses Montefiore, there's Beth Torah Cemetery that gets founded. And so these are just different congregations. And uh, there's one other, I suppose we should mention, it's a little bit earlier, it's within the city-owned Oakwood Cemetery. And we call it Oakwood Hebrew Cemetery. So there was another congregation that gets going just before the Civil War, and the city gives them a portion of Oakwood Cemetery in about 1866, I believe. I don't remember quite the, the date on that one, but so you're right, all in this kind of Eastern Richmond neighborhood, there's a clustering, a, a new clustering of Jewish cemeteries that serve these congregations that were not um, well-to-do and attending the really beautiful kind of synagogue uh, that uh, that the Beth Ahaba raises uh, in the early 20th century off of Franklin Street, just down the road from Monument Avenue. So it's an interesting kind of split in the patterns of the Jewish community uh, using these various burial grounds to kind of mark their identities in a certain way. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. Well, you know, we love talking about symbolism in the cemeteries, and we've already mentioned some differences in those Jewish stones, but even among Jewish traditions themselves, um, that Star of David that we think of as kind of the essential symbol for Judaism when we're thinking of your gravestones, if you go to Arlington Cemetery, say, or Richmond National Cemetery, and you see the Star of David, then that's a clear sign that the person buried there is, is of the Jewish faith. Um, but that Star of David at the period that we're talking about, kind of the turn of the 20th century, really represented Zionism, this idea of a, of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, a Jewish state, more than it did the religion kind of broadly speaking. And so you see that Star of David represented on those gravestones in Sir Moses Montefiore from, from the beginning, you know, from early on, the 1890s, early 1900s. But if you go over across town to Hebrew Cemetery, the earliest uh, example of that Star of David on the stone there I've been able to find is in the 1930s, like 1936. Oh, wow. And so it just shows you kind of the different ways that symbolism can change over time. And now I think there's plenty of those uh, Star of Davids on the newer grave markers at, at uh, the Hebrew Cemetery. But for a while there, it was something of a controversial symbol because again, a lot of these uh, Jews in Richmond that were associated with the reform communities felt like their home was here and they wanted to be associated with America and they didn't want to be accused of kind of looking elsewhere for, for a homeland. Um, hmm. So there was a, a split between those newer Jewish arrivals, I think, and the, the longer standing congregation here in town about Zionism and those political questions. Wow. And it shows up in those cemeteries. 
Well, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, most of our cemeteries, St. John's um, and Franklin Street and Shaco Hill, we all have walls around protecting those spaces. Well, walls are a long tradition for burial grounds, and that's yeah. one of the sadder parts, as we talked before, about the city's kind of a racial environment. And so a lot of the African-American cemeteries did not have enclosures of any kind or walls around them. And so that's another reason why they, they, they were able to be so vulnerable and yeah. uh, so dismissed by the white population. So you're right that cemetery walls have a lot of meanings, more than just keeping people out. You know? Yeah. Well, this was cool, Ryan. Thank you so much for talking to me today about the, the talking about the first um, Jewish burying ground in, in Virginia. It's fascinating. And Which you can almost see from Churchill, right? Almost. It's just at the bottom of Churchill, right uh, in between 20th and 21st Street. So that area is just packed with history. So if you want to see that revolutionary era, it certainly deserves a, a, a stop on that tour. Yeah, that founding generation is everywhere down there mm -hmm. at Chakabon. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody for, for watching us today. And don't forget, if you want to support us, we have our Graveyard Nerd t-shirt. We'll have a link down below. When you buy one of those, you help us while we're closed due to COVID-19. And don't forget to order Dr. Smith's book, uh, which will be out in November, Death and Rebirth in a Southern City. I want to make sure I get that right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Sarah.